Shalom Aleichem, everybody. Welcome back to the Yibanez, the Yibanez Beit Midrash. We're not in the Beit Midrash. We're in my home, in my study, but it's the Shari Truva Chabora. And here's the safer we're using. I see some of the people holding it up. Fantastic. Um, so this is Rabbeinu Yona. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Uh, we're really far away from Rosh Hashanah, but we should have Elo on our minds, right? Why not? After we get through this with cl this class, we are in Shar Bet, that's basically chapter 2, paragraphs 14 and 15. In the book <clears throat> that I just showed you, we're on page 170. Now before we start, I want to mention that uh, this class is dedicated to the Rufu Shalem of Rav Pinto, Yoshiyahu Yosef Ben Zachri, Bizrat Hashem, through our learning, she gives some merit and some spoofs to towards his Rufu Shalem. Okay, so hi everybody on Zoom, and here we go. The fifth way of inspiration. In other words, we're to be inspired to do tshuva. I just, for those who have not watched from the very beginning, I mean, Raboni, Rabbeinu Yona um, from Spain was unfortunately involved with bashing or, you know, uh, the Rambam. Okay, there was a lot of people that were upset with the Rambam, Maimonides. Now, Rabbeinu Yon is actually related through marriage to the Ramban. So this is like the following generation, and uh, he did a lot of tshuva, and he dedicated so much of his life towards, um, let's say, going back, you know, trying to undo the damage. So he became an expert, right? He was a big gadol, he was a gaon to begin with. And he dedicated his life to try to explain to people how tshuva should be done and the importance of it. So here we are in the fifth wave of inspiration. <clears throat> Why should we be inspired to do tshuva? Beseret yimei tshuva, right? What are the ten days of tshuva? Those are the ten days that fall between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, including those, including the two days of Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. So basically you have seven days. So during these ten days of tshuva, Hayira et dovar Hashem libo yachil bekirbo. So, right, the heart of one who fears the word of God should tremble within him. Should mamish, one should be full of fear during this time. Bidato ki kol ma'asav besefer nichtavin. Okay, now this is a very strange concept because God doesn't have a hand and he certainly doesn't write. Right? But yet we say it. We say that Hashem writes us in the book. Which book? There's three books open, right? The book of life, the book of uh, the opposite of life, right? And the book for the Benonim, right? The Benonim, the in, in, intermediate, in, the in-between people. How would you translate in intermediary type people? Benonim. Well, there's a very interesting comment because we have to admit there really is no such thing as a Shem writing in a book. I have to find that comment. Here it is. Now, if we go to Perki Avot, first of all, let's go to Perki Avot, chapter 2, Mishnah 1. It's, uh, it mentions, this is one of the statements of Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi. He would say, contemplate three things. Da ma lamala mimcha, know what is above you. Well, first of all, he says, know, you should contemplate these three things and you won't come to sin. In other words, it's a preventative, right? It's a prophylactic, a new word we came up with during the pandemic. Now, it's an old word, but now people are using it. Uh, anyway, know what is above you, right? Da ma lama mimcha. Ayin roe, ozen shomat, right? That an eye that sees, now Hashem doesn't have an eye. He doesn't have a body. An ozen, an ear that hears, he doesn't have ears. V'chol ma'asecha b'sefer nechtavim. And he's writing into the book all of your deeds. It's a very interesting concept. We should accept it, but we have to understand. The comment here describes, it says that regarding Perki Avot, it describes in human terms the fact that Hashem is aware of all a person's deed and never forgets them. That's really the, that's really the point here. So that when the, per, when the time for a person to be judged arrives, nothing will be overlooked. Remember, this is what the Rambam wrote in the Mar Nevuchim. The Mar Nevuchim is the guide to the perplexed. 
for those who were perplexed, right? Aren't we all? So one of the ideas, one of the major fundamental ideas the Rambam explains is that the Torah is written in the language of man. All of the different, I forget now what they're called, um, uh, there's a certain word, it's an English word, I'm, I'm forgetting my English. The, um, when we describe God in human terms, it's not that he has a hand, right? With a strong arm he took us out of Egypt, or that he gets angry that such a thing that he has emotions, or that he looks or he sees things. No. It's just so that we can understand, because we have an imagination, we can only imagine Hashem through our own eyes, something that we are familiar with. The main point is that Hashem never forgets. What does it mean to be written in a book? I don't know. But this is really what he's saying. In reality, Hashem does not record people's deeds in actual books, for he does not require the help of any tool to remember people's deeds. And I think that's understood. Okay? So, keeping this in mind, Be'esahi elukim yavi mishpat et kol ma'asei al kol ne'alam im tov imra. The, ba- the basic idea is that during this time, during those 10 days of tshuva, God will judge every deed, including everything that's hidden, for good or for bad, everything. That's when it's recorded, so to speak. Uh, I just want to have to get across this idea, and we will talk about it. Those 10 days are very unique and special. Let's just start with Rosh Hashanah. God Let's assume, right, there's a Maklokas when we were created, whether it was on the first of Tishrei or on the first of Nisan. When was the world created, either Nisan or Tishrei? It wasn't that the world was created, because the world was actually created five days before either point in time. So let's just stick with Tishrei. Me- meaning the 25th of El, that's when day one of the six days of creation, or let's say seven days of creation, took place. And it was on the sixth day of creation that man, man is the pinnacle of creation. So when we say that the world was created on Rosh Hashanah, we're talking about mankind. And uh, to a certain extent, like any human being would, right, would take stock and wonder, what should I do for my business, right? Every year you have to reevaluate how things are going, what needs improvement, what should be done away with. As we know, right, there was dispersion, there was flood, there's calamity, there's reward and punishment, right? So Hashem is evaluating, or let's say reevaluating, however you want to look at it. He's taking a cheshbon, right? A cheshbon and nefesh, uh, to a certain extent, for not for himself, but for the world that he created. So it's very important to know that's what's going to happen on Rosh Hashanah. And during these 10 days, we could, let's say we're benonim, because the people who are completely righteous, or completely the other way, they're going to be written and inscribed pretty much immediately. There's nothing to talk about. It, they're, they're solid, right? But hopefully, for us, may, basically the benonim, the intermediaries, right? The one intermediate, the ones who are in between, not extremely perfect, not extremely evil, right? We are benoni, benoni. So that's the word we're going to use. It's the interme- inter, the in between people. Okay, so we can change that. We can change who we are, especially during those days. Because by the time of Yom Kippur, when things are sealed, 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 signed, and delivered, just to keep in mind, we can always change throughout the year as well, right? Hashem has so much mercy. Uh, just to give you an idea of a Hasidish of worth, it's not such Hasidish, but it's, it's a Jewish concept. I don't go into the details of the history of how this came about, but the idea is that the whole month of Tishrei is about judgment, right? Even the zodiac sign symbolizes judgment through what we call the Mosnaim. The Mosnaim are the scales of justice. I think in English or Latin, whatever it's called, the Libra, right? Libra's uh, the scales of justice. And so what do you have there? What do you have there? You have Rosh Hashanah's Day of Judgment. You're going to have then what? You're going to have this 10 days of tshuva where you can overturn uh, and change. And then you have the Yom Kippur, the day it's sealed. And then during the seven days of Sukkot, the whole world is being judged as well in terms of, right, as we know the prophets speak about the 70 bulls that, that are brought by the Jewish people, by Israel, 
for the 70 nations that they would come up and somehow you know show recognition of the God of Israel and those who do not will not see rain in their land there's judgment on water there's judgment on the nations as well and by the way Rosh Hashanah is also all this has to do with every man not just the Jews but on the seventh day of Sukkot it's called Rosh Hashanah Rabbah and that is the final judgment on the non-Jews okay uh, that's the seventh day of the seventh day festival where we bring those 70 karbanos, seven plays an important number, important uh, role in the seven, uh, into the 70 nations, or the seven Noachide laws. And it's called Hoshana Rabbah. So that's the last and final day. And then there's the day after, which is a holiday for the Jews called Shemini Atzeris. Okay, so you see the three quarters already of that entire month is dealing with judgment. But the Hasidic word I began to tell you said, tells us that, yes, even though Rosh Hashanah, it's, um, let's say, written, Yom Kippur, it's sealed, perhaps by Sukkot, it's sent, and then Hashem reads it, right? If it's a, an envelope, or, you know, we're talking human terms here, an email, it's opened up and read uh, on Hanukkah. So you have all this time to do tshuva, right? You can always, no, the truth is you can, you have to do tshuva all the time. And you can always change things. But there's a special, unique opportunity during the 10 days of tshuva. During the 10, during the whole year, at least the men, women are very unique. They, they're worth, each one is worth 10 men, okay? A man needs nine other men to help his prayers ascend to heaven. Why the number 10 is, it's very interesting. I'm not going to go into it, but just the term yud, right? A Jew is called a yid. A yid and a yud are basically the same thing. It's the smallest letter, right? Number 10, right? In order, it's a community. A man needs a community much more um, in terms of prayer than a woman does. A woman has a very high soul and doesn't require nine other men. But anyway, during this 10 days of tshuva, of course a man should still go to a minion. Men, women, kick your husbands out of bed, right? But, the prayers are easily acceptable. Hashem, the king, comes out of his castle, of his palace, and he comes to the field to meet us, to greet us, to be involved with us. And um, so the, the individual prayer is heard just as well as when it is throughout the rest of the year with ten other men. That was, that was the point I wanted to make, something unique. And we're going to talk about what should one do, how should one behave, <clears throat> during these 10 days of tshuva, because that's how he begins. So he continues like this. So during this period, God will judge every deed, right? So in Rosh Hashanah, Gemara Rosh Hashanah 16a, it talks about how a person is judged on Rosh Hashanah and the decree is sealed on Yom Kippur. I actually wanted to, do I have the sitter here? No. Um, I do have a sitter here. I'll do my best. Um, let me just tell you that on Thursday mornings, just to, I know this is not really the subject, but I just want to get this point across because a lot of people are not aware of this. And um, I run into a lot of ex Christians, and uh, not ex Christians, Christians momish, right? Uh, people who are missionaries and are trying to convince me of something else, whatever it is, and uh, they got the whole thing wrong. <clears throat> These people say to me, listen, Jew, <laughs> why are you celebrating Rosh Hashanah or observing Rosh Hashanah or think for even a moment that on Rosh Hashanah, that's called New Year's, right? On the seventh month of the calendar. God told you the first of Nisan is going to be the first of the months to you. So, and we have to ask ourselves this question. Why are we celebrating Rosh Hashanah called the new year, the beginning of the year, on the first day of the seventh month? What are we... <laughs> There's many ways to look at the calendar. I mean, Gemara Rosh Hashanah begins that there are four new years. There's more than one new year. I'm mean, just to get this off to my chest, because you have, let's say, the school year, at least in America and maybe other uh, north, um, uh, north of the hemisphere, northern hemisphere countries. School year begins in September. Right? It's, it's, you can have a new year for something. Uh, 
grapes, right? You have a new year of a grape harvest. It always comes in the same time of the year, at least here in Israel. Maybe California is different than New York. I have no idea. But I know Israel. There's always a season for grapes. There's a season for school. Or there's a season for judgment. Right? So I wanted to show you. On Yom Chamishi, we sing the Song of the Levium. It actually does not tell me which uh, parak. Uh, usually the Sidur tells you which parak. <coughs> but I'll just tell you what it says. It speaks about Taku the Shofar, below the Shofar at the moon's renewal. The word Chodesh, Bechodesh Shofar. So below, or taku, takia shofar, below the shofar at the moon's renewal, bekesa liyom chagenu. Bekesa means covering over on the day of our festival, which really means the new moon. Bekesa means the new moon, the day of our festival. Now what festival, the chag is a festival, which festival do we have? Which festival do we have that falls out on Rosh Chodesh? It's talking about is what it's talking about. So first of all, Pesach is on the 15th of the month, full moon. Shavuos, okay, it's on the 6th of the month. It's not a full moon. It's not a, it's not a new moon either. Then you have, let's go to Sukkot. Obviously the 15th. Shemini Yatzeris is on the 20, whatever, the 23rd, 24th. Here, 23rd. Here you have, right, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur is on the 10th. It's, again, not on the full moon, not on the new moon. Rosh Hashanah is the only Chag, it's the only festival listed in the Torah to celebrate that actually falls on a, we call it a new moon, right? And the next verse, remember, this is King David. Ki li Yisrael hu, this is a statute, this is a law, this is etched into reality. Mishpat le Yaakov, this is a day of judgment for God. Listen, you can't change, you can't, this is King David, okay? So, that's the reality. Just wanted to get that off my chest. Here we go. Let's go. Continue. Rabbeinu Yonah is going to discuss how a person should spend her time during these 10 days of tshuva. Okay? Let's say you had a court case. And you were going, here it's talking about going before a king. You had... A, um, a judgment before an earthly king, right? We know King Solomon, he was a judge, right? You can be a judge and a king at the same time. You can wear two hats, or two crowns, or a, one a crown and one hat. I don't know. So, you're going before a flesh and blood king. Great. What's, what are you going to do? Yecharad charada gdola. I don't know if you know the root from the word charedi, right? Charedi is people who quake, who shake, who are full of fear, and that's a good thing. So one should be filled with a tremendous amount of awe and fear. The asit atzot benavsho. And begin to formulate plans. Listen, <laughs> you got to hire the best lawyers. You have to do what you call looking into the books for precedents, things, the previous... Um, Previous court cases that could be to your, you know, uh, benefit, uh, sculpability, prove your innocence. Why not? How much? What are you going to do? You're going to go to the beach. You're going to hang out. Now the truth is, if that helps you think, perhaps maybe that's an eitzah, as it says here, yasit atzut. Right? You're going to put all your counsel into this. You, you, your life could depend on it. Could depend on it. Bekol darche charitzut yachish. Miflatlo, you're going to do everything to save yourself, right? To deliver yourself from whatever you don't know what the judgment's going to be, but you're going to make every effort. Lotale arucho lefanot al yamin o al small. You're not going to go to the left. You're not going to the right. But rather, his asek the yeser chafetzav. Um, I'm sorry, and you're not going to involve yourself in any other of your affairs, right? You know, you're going to get phone calls, you're going to put your phone on silent, you're not going to take any calls that are not from your lawyers or from your investigators, your paid uh, staff that's going to help you find uh, what you need to, to, um, to you know, m uh, de defend or in investigate your innocence and the facts of the court case. V'lo yashgiach lepetach lesadeid ad maso. It's a little bit of a, a poetic, you know, it's taken from Tanakh, but you're not going to, um, 
I lost my hit. You're not going to make furrows or break up clumps of soil in your land, meaning you're not going to go down and start farming. You're not going to go out and start doing your daily work that you normally do if you're a carpenter or if you're a farmer. You're not going to be involved in that. Velo yifna dera krami, and you're not going to go to the vineyards either. You know, you're not going to hang out at the bars either. Velo yitra pebi yom tsara me hachim lev li natsel kitzvi miyad. Right? So on this day of distress, you are like overwhelmed. You're not going to relax. You're not going to be able to relax for a moment. Right? So you can be rescued like a deer from the hunter's hand. Again, this is a poetic um, style from Tanakh. But you're going to do everything you can. You're going to put your full attention. You're not going to get distracted. You're not going to do anything that you normally would do when you want to just chill, when you want to have downtime. Right? You go hunting. You go sit and, I don't know, sit in a tree for hours or fishing for, <laughs> you know, waiting for a bite. You're not going to do any of that. Now, if this is true, this is how you would react and act in a case of a judgment against the flesh and blood king. Um, this is how you would normally act. So then how much more so if you're facing judgment before the king of kings, right? So you're not going to act the same, right? You're going to act even more uh, seriously. So Rabbeinu Yonah bemoans the fact there are people who act otherwise. I mean, what, what are we going to call them? We're going to call them fools? <laughs> what are we going to call them? The fools. Let's call them what they are. I mean, they just don't know. Many of them are just ignorant. But every human being, right? Not in Jew as well. should understand this idea. Lechein ma no'alo hayotzim lepa'olam aluvodotam ade erev. How foolish, how absolutely foolish are these people. They go out to those activities, right? They work from morning until evening. And what comes up? All of a sudden, now you're standing there on Yom Kippur, let's say Rosh Hashanah first, 10 days of Tshuva. This is passing. Now, now you're in those days. And you have no idea what your verdict is going to be. I mean, come on. You got to come in knowing. You have to have some confidence. Okay, I'm not saying overconfidence, right? But you have 40 days to prepare for Yom Kippur, right? From Elo, right? And there's a famous expression. I, I mentioned this to the guys this morning. You, you, the women probably don't relate to it, and they don't need to because they have this inner chamber, right? This, they're, they're like, they're walking holy and holy people, right? Holy of holies. But the guys in the yeshiva need to be screamed at sometimes by the Rosh Hashiva. The Rosh Hashiva is screaming at them, the psukim, the psukim that say, is there a city, is there a city that hears the shofar being blown and doesn't tremble? And here you are, we're beginning the month of Elul and we're blowing the shofar and you are asleep. You're not being moved. I think the women are much more in tune than men are. They don't need such um, tochacha or musr. But nevertheless, there are people who during these 10 days of tshuva, during, you know, days of awe, the trial is going on, and they don't even know what their verdict's going to be. So, So why their hearts should contemplate what to answer on the day they are spoken for of their judgment. Now, there's a verse that proves this idea. It says, I think it's Song of Songs. Ma na uh, yeah, Song of Songs 8 8. Shir Shirin. Biyom Shidab Shidubar Bo. I have a good translation over here. We have a little sister who has no breasts. What shall we do for our sister on the day she's spoken for? Now, you should know that the Song of Songs is extremely uh, allegorical, very hard to understand. But I'll tell you in, in note number nine what it's talking about. In the Medrash, the Medrash explains that when it says our sister, it's referring to the Jewish people, our brothers and sisters, our sister. And the day she is spoken for is referring to Yom Kippur, is the day of judgment. Okay, so keep that in mind. Rabbeinu Yonah now describes how a spiritually attuned person, so what we describe with someone who's sleeping, who's not spiritually in tune. What about, hopefully we are at least trying to wake up, right? We have a few months, right? A few months before uh, Elo, before Tishrei. But nevertheless, 
we want to be spiritually attuned. How should we spend our Aser Simei the 10 days of Tshuva? Roy l'ko yirei elokim, lema'at ba'asakaf, close your business early, right? You normally have the business open during Elul, or let's say the 10 days of Tshuva for 8, 10, 12 hours, cut, cut out a few hours early, right? It's appropriate for anyone who fears Hashem to limit his involvement in the worldly affairs during this period of time. I do have uh, an underline, I underline this point, and let's see why. And it's impractical for most people to completely detach themselves during, from their worldly responsibilities during this time. Nevertheless, a person should minimize his involvement in other activities as much as the person can, so they can devote a significant amount of time to doing tshuva. Okay? So if you normally go to the concert, or the, what do you, you know, the, the, the Philharmonic, whatever, I don't know, whatever you do, to, you know, obviously you can't close your business down. People need your services, right? That's why you're in the business to start with. Not for the money, right? But to help people. So you're not going to diminish it. So uh, find time. F- find the time. You'll see that it will pay off. Liot Rayonav Nichatim. And during this time that you are uh, down downtiming your your outside activities, let your thoughts be occupied regarding the Nichtam, regarding the judgment, the upcoming judgment. Mm-hmm. And set set and establish for yourself for yourself during e- during the day and evening's time. I, I, I almost don't like this word anymore, but we have to go back to it, right? It's not a bad word. Lihit bodeid bichedrav. To be isolated. <laughs> to quarantine yourself. Eh, or find solitude. That, that's really, that's, that's what he's talking about. Set aside times to find yourself without distractions, right? Eh, solitude. So you can improve. Oh, that's, sorry, that's uh, the next thing. Uh, set aside times in the morning and the evening for solitude so you can search your ways. Do a cheshbon and nefesh. Get up early. To be involved in the, wor- in the ways of doing tshuva. In order to improve your actions. That's what life's about. And this, thank God, this comes every year. We live long enough, we can, you know, get into the, not the rut, but get into the right mode, right? Knowing that we're approaching the high holidays. Whatever you experience during the Elo and those 10 days, bring it with you for the rest of the year. Take that charge, take that energy, take that insight that you have experienced for yourself during this time and bring it into the rest of the year. And then the following year, Elevate yourself even more and bring that into the rest of the year as well. Okay, so what should you do? You should wake up well before dawn, occupy yourself with the ways of truth, improving your deeds. Lishpoch siach, right, to pour out through, well, we didn't read the word heart yet, but to pour out through prayers. Siach. Lishayt tefila, rina, lahapil tachina. All types of prayers and cries and make um, supplications like Tachanunim, Vaha'et Eit Ratzon, because this time is called Eis Ratzon. The time itself is called a time of favor, finding favor in Hashem's eyes, with Tfila Nishmatbo, and our prayers are especially heard during this time. And we have a verse in Isaiah 49 8. The verse goes like this So said the Lord, in a time of favor, I answered you. Already there's a special time. Eis Ratzon. That's what it says. Kor Marshem. Be'es Ratzon Aniticha. At a, this unique time, in uh, Eis Ratzon, I have answered you. On a day of salvation, I have helped you. Ubiyom Yeshua is Articha. And I will watch you and I will make you a people of the covenant to establish a land to cause to inherit the desolate heritage. Rashi mentions, what does it mean, Ace Ratzon? In the time of prayer, when you seek my favor and, and appease me, okay, on the day of salvation, when you need the salvation. 
He's talking about the ten days of Tshuva. Ace I mean, it's not the only time through the year, right? At a Brit Mila, especially, is a time to make prayers, shoot them up, right? At a Chuppah, there's different times. At Mincha and Shabbos, there's different times. There are Ace Ratzon. Okay, 13 down below. I'll just read the comment here. From this verse, we see that certain times are considered times of favor. And that during such times, Hashem is more likely to answer one's prayers. He says, it's a Shretzo, and I'm going to answer you. Ramon Yonah will dem- immediately demonstrate that the entire 10 days of Tshuva is considered a Shretzo. Okay, so we read Isaiah... 49.8. Now, Gemur Yavamos brings a verse from Isaiah 55.6. Now, regarding this idea, Amru, uh, Amru Zichron Levracha, it says in um, 55.6, it says like this, Seek the Lord when he is found. Call him when he is near. Dear Shu Hashem behimatz o. Seek him when he is, it doesn't, it doesn't even make sense. When he is found, when he's available, when he's mamish close, right? Call him when he is near. So what does uh, the Gemara say about that? When scripture says this, seek Hashem where he can be found. Ela seres hayami. This is referring to those ten days. Shebein Rosh Hashanah, Liyom HaKippurim. This is what we're talking about. This is called an Ace Ratzon. Now, even though you can, one could spend, and actually should spend, the 10 days of tshuva doing tshuva, you should know that there's a special obligation to do tshuva, especially on Yom Kippur, right? Don't just think, oh, and it is true, there is a certain truth to this, that the air you breathe on Yom Kippur, the day itself, atones. It's true, right? Again, I don't mean to sit there and bash the Christians, but the, the, the Torah tells you, that the day itself atones. So you don't need all this other stuff, right? But you need to do tshuva, right? So there's two things. It's true, the day itself atones. But you need to do tshuva. And when I say the Christians, what they say is they say, without a Yom Kippur offering, with, that was a big thing for me when I first came, became religious. Battling with these Christian ideas, because uh, being grow, growing, in, growing up in a, we call it a, Judeo-Christian society, you are brainwashed, you are infiltrated. In, co- in what is that? The, the shot? Not vaccinated, but they give you like you're you're full of this bacteria and virus called Christianity, even though you're you're not you're not you don't have to be a Christian, you just grow up around it, right? And so they tell you that um what, what was I thinking? That um now, I lost my train of thought on that one. Um, but basically, we were talking about like Yom Kippur, that you need, you, you need something, right? If you need something to be forgiven. Uh, the truth is, the day itself, as I was saying, the day itself, ha- it, that's what the Torah says. It says that the day itself, we're going to read it shortly. Um, Actually, I just tell you that if you go to Vayikra, we'll just skip down to Vayikra, chapter 16, verse 30. It says, for on this day. Oh, they, they think that you, they were telling you, oh, what are you going to do? You don't have a temple. You don't have a sacrifice. You'll never find atonement. And, I, you know, a lot of Jews who don't know anything, you know, fall for this. But the Torah says, for on this day, in Hebrew, ki biyom hazeh, the very day is yechaper lechem. It doesn't say you need a korban. The day itself atones for you. Letar heschem, to purify you. Mikol chatotechem, for all your sins. Lifnei Hashem, before God, and you will be cleansed. It's an amazing concept. Of course you still need to do tshuva. Don't, don't uh, think, but you don't need the korban, right? Unfortunately, we don't have it. Of course, it would, be, it would be quite beneficial if we did, but that does not stop the individual from... Uh, doing tshuva and finding, let's just say, forgiveness, okay? And actually, that's where we're at now. Uh, on page 173, B'mitzvah ase. It's actually a mitzvah ase. Now, there's different opinions of what the 613 mitzvahs are, but it's a mitzvah ase minatora, and we'll see the Rambam shortly, uh, from the Torah, la'ir, 
la'ir adam es rucha, that the person is obligated to arouse themselves, lachs or b'tshuva, b'yom kippurim, to actually do tshuva. And I just read the verse. Now what does that mean? Uh, comment 14. Okay, I, I'm going to read, I want to read for you the Rambam in Hilchish Tshuva, it's chapter 2, uh, Halacha 7. Yom Kippur is the time of tshuva for all, both individuals and the community at large. It is the apex of forgiveness and pardon for Israel. Accordingly, everyone is obligated to repent and confess on Yom Kippur. The mitzvah of confession of Yom Kippur begins on the day's evening, before one eats his final meal, lest, God forbid, one choke to death in the meal before confessing. Although a person confessed before eating, he should confess again during the evening service, Yom Kippur night, and similarly repeat the confession in the morning, and again in the Musaf, and again in the afternoon, and again at Nila, five times, at which point in the service should one confess? Question mark. So during the Amida, during the silent prayer, as well as during the, the um, repetition, Okay, so you see, it's a mitzvah to do tshuva, to confess. And we're on page, I think, 174 at the top. And we're continuing with this idea of what the rabbis have taught us. Kiyom, kiyom kippuri mechaper im tshuva. Right, the Gemara in Yuma explains that Yom Kippur works with tshuva. It does, it has this magical effect. But it has to start from the bottom up. Hashem's always there from the top down, but it has to come from us. al Kain, his hiranu ha-ketush and entire lifnei Hashem b'tshuvatena. Therefore, the, the Torah is telling us to purify ourselves before God on Yom Kippur by doing tshuva. Hu yichaper aleinu b'yom hazel etaritano. And then he will provide for us the atonement on this day um, and will help purify us from the stain of sin. Okay, so far that was chapter 14, uh, paragraph 14. Paragraph 15 is not that long. I think we'll finish it quite early, but I did want to read for you the Gemara in Shabbos 153a. So we're going to quote it, we're going to go through it quickly, and then we're going to come back to it and go through it a little bit um, more in depth. Derech Shishi, the, fifth, the, um, the sixth way that a person should be aroused to do tshuva, Kol Eis, Yachin Likrat Elukav, be prepared at every moment to call out to Hashem. Kilo Yoda Ha'adam Es Ito, a person doesn't know when he's going to die. So you have to be ready and prepared at all moments, lest you die, right? You don't know when you're going to die. Al Kain, Kliotav, Ishtonain, Right there, one should therefore arouse his conscious, meaning his kidneys, his conscious, and firmly establish himself with righteousness. In other words, try to be righteous. I tell you, I, I certain. I'm not gonna. I don't know what sect of Judaism they are, but they're. Let's just call them quite modern, whatever that means. And they say, we don't have to be tzaddikim. God doesn't expect it from us. We can just be ban on him. Hi. Try to arouse yourself. Try. Try to be righteous. Why not? Lahashiv rucha betahara elokim asher natana. When you give back your soul to Hashem, why not give it back the way it came? It came pristine. It came uh, unpolluted. Um, you know what I mean? It came pure. And you can return it that way. Why not? That's the way God wants it. So try everything you can to return your soul in the state of purity to God who gave it to you. Right? Do this cheshbon and nefesh before you go to sleep every single night. But now you have the whole month of Elul, and you have the ten days of tshuva, and you have all of Yom Kippur. But try to do this all the time. Yifkadein levakrim l'regim Yivchina. Examine them every morning. Every morning. Always. Constantly. If you find anything sinful, do tshuva. 
Now, Rabbeinu Yonah is going to present a teaching of the sages. Now, we go, we, we'll, we'll read the Gemara real quick, even though he just brings it down. Let's use his words, and uh, that'll be the quick summary. But then we'll, when we finish another few lines, we'll go back. So it says in Gemara Shabbos 153a, Rabbi Lezer Oimer, he said to his students, Shuv yom echad lifnei mitatcha. Now, does this make any sense? You don't know when you're going to die. So if he tells his students, do tshuva one day before you die. So that's very nice. But the student said to him, Rabbeinu, Rabbi, the chiyadam yodea boizel yomut. Since when does a man know what day he's going to die? It's like, I mean, unless you're sick in bed and you know the doctor says that person doesn't have too many hours left, then you could, uh, you know, assume. But otherwise... You're healthy, you're walking around. Why should you think, tomorrow I'm going to die? So the, the student said, person doesn't know he's going to die. He says, you're right. <laughs> you're right. You're right. So how does one fulfill this idea of repenting one day before he dies? He said to them, Amr lem, Kol shechein yeshuva yom. How much more so? You have to do tshuva today. Today. Sheme yamud l'machar. Maybe you will die tomorrow. You don't know. So, what comes from this? What is the bottom line result that every single day you'll do tshuva? Because you do not know when you will die. Now, we're going to men- quote a verse from Kohelis. Kohelis is Ecclesiastes, chapter 9, verse 8. King Solomon, pretty smart guy. The kol ace at every moment, all times, you begadecha, your clothing, your, your outer garments should be livanim. What does that mean? White. White, this is not a racial thing. This is in terms of clean cleanliness. V'shemin al roshcha al yachsar. And the, the oil should never lack from your head. What does this verse mean? So, loivein begadim. This idea of having white clothes is a mashal, is an analogy. It's an analogy towards your soul. We're going to talk about the word shemen and nefesh are basically, basically the same letters, whatever, the same idea. But um, so he says like this. The whiteness of the clothes is a metaphor of the soul being cleansed of its sin, which is achieved through tshuva. I want to just read the comment here. When a person sins, the soul becomes stained and is comparable to a soiled garment. Just as laundering removes the stain from a garment, restores its original whiteness, so does tshuva remove the stain of sin from the soul and restore it to its pristine state. So, we understand that part. The Hashemin, what about the Shemin, the oil that will never be lacking from the head, is a mashal amasim tovim. That is compared to your actions. Why? Shem tov. Uh, she, I'm sorry. The Shemin mashal amasim tovim, the Shem tov. And a good name. So you have a good actions and a good name. Usually they're interrelated. How you act is how people remember your name. So there's a Pusik, there's a verse... And does it say where? It's also in Kohelis, chapter 7, verse 1. Um, did I copy it down? Yeah, I have it somewhere. Here it is. A good name is better than good oil. The day of death than the day of one's birth. It's interesting. Um, we talked about uh, Miriam last week and her death. The truth is, nobody even cared when she was born. But once she died, retroactively, we, we gave a lot, of, a lot of respect to her. So the Rashi says at the bottom here, on the day of death, better than the day of one's birth, when Miriam was born, no one knew who she was. But when she died, all of a sudden, we need water. There's no water. The, the well disappeared. So too, the day Aaron died, the, cal- the clouds of glory disappeared as well. Okay. Uh, what I want to show you about this, the, um, in the middle of Rashi, so when it says, right, a good name is better than good oil. So good oil runs down. 
as it says in Psalms 133 verse 2, as the good oil on the head runs down upon the beard. A good name, however, goes up, and I will make your name great, as God said to Abraham in Genesis 12 verse 2. Now, good oil is only temporary, but a good name is eternal. And that you can find in Psalm 72, verse 17. Actually, it's one of my son's name, uh, Yaakov Yinon. Yinon is one of the four names, possible names of Mashiach. Yinon means shall live forever. So Yaakov shall live forever. Here it says, Yehishemo le'olam lifnei shemesh, Yinon shemo. Which basically may, means, right, may his name be forever uh, before the sun, S-U-N, uh, Yinon is his name. Anyway, getting back into the uh, Rabbeinu Yonah. So he uh, mentions just as a afterthought, in the above verse, what Shlomo Melech was teaching, that a person should ensure that he's always in a state of tshuva, and that he should never forget the good name associated with worthy deeds. And that's a beautiful saying. So now this is just the final run, uh, a parable that will illustrate this point, and then we'll go back into the Gemara, time permitting, Bezrat Hashem, of Shabbos 153a. So the, the rabbi said in the uh, Medrash, in Kohelis Rabbah, regarding this idea, it's, it's compared to a wife of a sailor. Masha li ishto shel mem lamed chet, me malach, but this is a sailor. Shahaisa, what she would do, mit kashet, mit kashetet, vitasim befuch, e necha, ubala oiver, urchos yamin. Whenever her husband went out on a trip and a sailor would go, who knows, weeks at a time, months at a time, half a year at a time, a long time, right? She was very strange. She would all get dressed up, put her makeup on, and the neighbors saw her doing this. Now, I don't know what a neighbor would think. When the husband goes away, the woman gets all dressed up and puts on the makeup on. Well, the the neighbors came to her. The Tomarn, the Tomarna Lo The the Yentes, right? The the curious neighbors, they would uh, say to her, "Hello, ba'alech halach bederach lemeirachok ve'amaze leshav titiyafa." Your husband's going for a long time, isn't he? We, you know, we know how long he goes away for. Why are you getting all dressed up and all beautied for yourself? For, for no reason. I'm relin. She says, you know, my husband's a sailor. Now, that's true. They knew that. But what they didn't know was the following thing. I don't know why they didn't know this, but at least this is the wife. Oh, this is what she said to them. I mean, today we have motors. I mean, we have inboard motors, outboard motors. Apparently, they use sailboats. <laughs> a sail, uh, I don't know. That's what they, they, they went across the sea, the ocean, the Mediterranean. Who knows how they traveled, where they went. But they used the wind. Can you believe this? They used the wind. And the wind is like the luck of the draw. You could be away for a long time, or you could be, I don't know, you could just sell out. Sell out. Right, you sail out, and before you know it, you're back at shore, right? Because the wind took you right back. So uh, she says, perhaps the sea wind will change direction, and will he will actually return swiftly and soon. By always looking after my appearance, she's saying, I ensure that if he does return, I will f I, he will find me adorned. Similarly, similarly, this is Hashem might come at any moment. To take a person from this world. We don't know. Therefore, one should always prepare themselves for the possibility of doing tshuva by amassing good deeds. Beautifully put. So he takes this idea of viewing today as one of the last days of your life. And this should be uh, a step which one should imagine. Ye the yesh ala adam lisha'er bin nafsho. So one should try to measure within his mind, imagine, the yoto sha'anan u'shlav. That what? You're in a calm and peaceful state. Try to imagine, while you're in a calm and peaceful state, ech yidag levavo v'yira v'ra'ad yavo bo biyom hamavis. So you should, how your heart will worry. In other words, you're right now, 
Try being in a calm state. Know you're in a calm state. Breathe. Right? How it's going to be on that judgment day. On the day you're going to actually be wearing and trembling. On the day of your death. You're going to send to heaven and you have to give an accounting of your soul, your entire life to God. How are you going to confess to Hashem? How are you going to confess at the time of your death with a broken heart, full of regret? You know what? Don't wait. Do it now. You know how much trouble, what, you're going to have to remember everything? I mean, through my life, I remember things I did when I was young. Maybe not so young. And, wow, I, I thank God. Wow, thank you for restoring that memory. <laughs> I, I wish I didn't have that memory. But that's something I have to do true before. So imagine at that moment, you're lying on the bed. Who knows? The, you know, someone comes in and tells you it's time to say the Shema. You're on your way out. This is the time to really start and think. Yeah, it is. But how have I that while every day while you still have a calm mind, right? You're in a somewhat in a calm and peaceful state right now. Don't wait until that time comes. You won't be able to think properly. Um, but rather, yutbadeh, belev nidche you moira shemayim alav. So this is what you should do every day of your life. You should confess your sins with a humbled heart and let the fear of heaven be upon you in the way you imagine it will be on the day that you die. So you're not all mixed up. You have a calm, hopefully calm, somewhat calm. Now I want to go into that Gamora I mentioned, because there's a few comments I thought were relative, you know, interesting, relatively interesting. We mentioned, um, I'll just read it quickly, you know, in so the Gemara on uh, 153a in Shabbos mentions a brisa. Rebbe Leizer says to students, "Return, do tshuva one day before you, your death." So the the comment over here says, <clears throat> even someone who was evil, pretty much evil, his all of his life. I lost my face. Al yitiyah Never give up hope that Hashem will be merciful upon you. Just know this, even if you do confess on your last day, Hashem will accept it. This is a very important to know. And we said that even the, the, the students asked him, but Rebbe, a man doesn't know when he's going to die. He said, you're right. How much more so that you should do tshuva every single day, because basically today, perhaps tomorrow you will die. So, um, you know, he didn't say, do tshuva today. He said, I'm sorry, he didn't say, today you might die. He said, tomorrow you might die. Why is that significant? So the, the, the commentators explain that people who die the same day without being sick is a very unusual thing. Obviously, today with modern cars and trains and all this, it's true, you really could die without being sick. But in the old days... It was very difficult to die, just pitom, dead. No, People got sick first. So the Tana didn't want to speak about anything that is not common. And that's very, you should just know, this is usually the case when the Gemara, the Gemara talks. Furthermore, if the person did die that day, she'im yamot ba'ota yom, shechata, the day that he sinned, then the actual death will atone for the sin itself. So if one passes on the very day that they did a sin, that death will atone, or usually atones for the sin itself. Keep that in mind. And this is why he said, maybe you'll die tomorrow, because because it's the death will not atone necessarily for the sin that you did one or two days prior. Okay, then another comment, uh, basically when he says, it comes out that each and every day you're going to do tshuva. And even King Solomon himself said in that famous verse in chapter, in, in uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 9 verse 8, right? Bekol A said, every time your, your garment should be white and the oil should be upon your head 
It should never be lacking. So Rashi, da 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 da. The the Maharsha focuses on on the word bigadecha, your garments. It's a language. It's plural. Your garments. Your garments should be white. The intent here is your masim tovin, your actions. The the garments are your actions, and that's called midos, meaning your character. Just like we find in the Torah, the, there's a language it talks about the um, the uniform, mido bad. It's a character. It's basically midos. It's a measurement, and that is used regarding a begit. And the verse is coming to tell you that that your actions and your character traits should be white, blichet, without sin. It's telling you it's possible. Don't don't tell me it's not possible. It's totally the Torah is telling you you can do it. And then what about the word shemen? Shemen is the same letters as neshama. I mean, there's a hey, but it's not in the same order. But it's the same letters as the root of a neshama. Neshama means your soul. Lo yachsor lo, you're not you're not um, lacking for it for the soul. Davar besudos abolam azeh, there won't be anything lacking in the nourishment that you will receive in the world to come. Now the Ben Yehuda, as the Ben Yishchai explains, that um, it's really upon a person to imagine in their mind at every moment the time of his of their death. Yal bishuhu betachritim levanim. The tachritim are the white garments we wear when we pass on. He's saying that one should imagine wearing them. This is obviously your life, you're healthy. Just try to imagine the, I don't know what you want to call them, the death clothes, you know, these are the clothes you're going to wear for eternity until you are risen in the resurrection of the dead. In order to sub make your heart submissive, so that you're not lacking the shemen. Remember the soul. You shouldn't lack the soul. Um, here he translates. He doesn't say shemen is soul. Sorry. He says the shemen is the chachma. Now chachma to me, chachma in the soul. That's wisdom. You don't want to lack the shemen, meaning the wisdom from your thoughts. Now, mitochach, from this, lo yochal yetzara tanifa. That if you have this consciousness, the evil inclination could not cause you to dirty your soul. You'll always want to remain white, meaning um, clean soul, and you'll do everything to overcome your yetzer. Your yetzer heart will not be able to overpower you. How much more so, lo yatzliet letanef if es divorav umasav. Not only won't he affect your soul, he won't affect your speech or your actions because you'll be in check, so to speak. Okay, I think that was there was one more thing I did want to share. Um, let's try it. This is from the Mahara on this idea of return, repent one day before your death. So the Mahara asked the question, Madu, why did Rebbe Yezer use? The language. Shuv ko, he didn't say, Shuv kol yumeichecha. He says, do tshuva one day before your death. He could have said, but he didn't, do tshuva every single day. So, mikak noda. From here it should become known. Tzarek tamid. That one has to always do tshuva. Ukfi shabir et devarav basof. What it seems to be obvious from his own words at the end. But why didn't you just say in the beginning? So the answer seems to be, according to the Mara, that if he would have said you have to do true every day, it would be mashma, it would infer, it would infer that anyone who sinned all his days, you might think that he can't, so you do true every day, fine, but if I didn't do true, give up hope, he wouldn't be able to do it at the end. Because he has so much sin. Therefore, he uses this specific language that from it you can infer that also someone who sinned his whole life, even the one day before his death, he can do tshuva and it has an effect. The he to'il lo. 
it actually affects, is effective. Furthermore, there's another hint to this. She'ikr tshuva, the main point of tshuva is, b'miyuchad b'zman ha'samuch l'misoso. The truth is, tshuva is more effective the day before you die. Why? Because if you do tshuva in your 20s, in your 30s, and then you stop, well, guess what? You have a whole lot of things you got to work on the day before you die. So you might as well just do it before, not, I'm not saying don't do it. I'm saying that he actually said, do it one day before you die, meaning do it every day. If he said, um, do it every day, maybe it wouldn't have so much effect. But doing it one day before you die has more effect on your past sins. Let me just read his words. It will be much more clear. Shi'ikr tshuvahi, the prime tshuva is miyuchad bizmana samukla misoso, is to be done before you die. Kadei, in order, kashiya pater mina olam, when you pass on from this world, v'tashuv nishmato li yotzro, and you return your soul to your maker, tashuv zaka v'nikia, it will be returned purified and clean. Masha'en came, which is not going to be the case, if you only did tshuva when you were 20 and then you get you know you didn't do anymore this keeps you on your ball on your toes right to do tshuva before you die so you'll do tshuva through your whole life and not just rely i think they call it um resting on your laurels whatever that means in other words your past successes wow i really did tshuva when i was in my 20s or 30s i'm you know <laughs> i don't have to do so much anymore it's not true Right? Do it one day before you die, which means every single day. Don't count on what you did when you were younger, because obviously there are stains, and this is what we want to get rid of. Okay, so I hope ooh, we finished it in exactly or within an hour. So um, what we're going to do is take questions from the Zoom or comments from the people, and I'm just going to sign off on the camera and just say thank you for participating. We look forward to seeing you again. Or you, you can look forward to seeing us again next week. And if you want to join us, there is a link below in the description box. You can send us a WhatsApp, and we'll send you all the information. Okay, so call to have a great life, and we'll see you next week. Shabbat shalom, shabbat shalom,